but now we proceed uh, to our second second um, uh, uh, keynote. So, Dr. Uh, Sarah Cornell. So, so Sarah is a is an associate professor and principal researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center, and she has focused and she focuses her research in global sustainability. She has been a member in the research group developing planetary boundaries framework. We heard already from, from, from Jason and, and she coordinates the center's research and international collaborations on earth resilience. So it's honor to have you Sarah here in as a keynote in our, our seminar and I mentioned so same thing for you. So you have now maximum let's say half an hour uh, for your speech and then some quick comments directed to you and then general discussion. And I made you now, I mean, proactively as a co-host. So if you want to share something uh, on the screen, so please, but definitely the floor is, 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 is yours. I mean, this is, uh, this is a Nordic seminar. So some of us are in, in Oslo. You see in, uh, in the back back you see uh, the, uh, the 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 Imperial Alexander University in Finland that they call nowadays University of Helsinki and you Sarah are in 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 Sweden and that's reason why we need reminders from Jason so so we here who are living here in the Nordics at the very moment so Sarah please the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yuka, and greetings from a very frosty and beautiful and extremely sunny mid Sweden. Um, I've had to sort of move, as you can see, I'm in my shed um, and um, I'll be moving around when the sun brings me. Anyway, um, let's get to it. I was given this extraordinary challenging title. Um, thanks, Yuka. Um, one planet, one humankind. And as many as you know, I'm a, a earth system scientist by background. I, I understand my, my job is to try to understand the way that the planet looks from a biophysical perspective. So I'm going to start the discussion today, picking up on some of the themes that actually Jason has, has already introduced, um, but starting with this biophysical science um, entry point, and then we'll get human. So from this planetary perspective, what is sustainability? Well, I think many of us who've been involved in global change processes for the last um, few decades, we've been profoundly influenced by James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis's view of, of Gaia, that's kind of a shorthand, for trying to understand how Earth functions as a living planet, different from the other planets that we know of. Um, Jim Lovelock extends as much as sort of saying it helps for us to think of the planetary ecosystem really as a single organism that does what it can to maintain the conditions for its survival. So from this planetary perspective and recognize the, the livingness of planet Earth, there are some important ideas that come into our understanding of global sustainability. One is this co-evolution of the living parts of Earth and the non-living parts, really, of life and climate is my, my shorthand for that. But also this idea homeostasis, this tendency to try to maintain um, stable enough conditions um, for, for ongoing survival. And that becomes possible because um, of the diversity of life on Earth, the, um, you know, kind of we use the language of niches or ecologists do. Um, and diversity allows that kind of responsiveness to change, shifting the feedbacks in the way that we understand the system. So like I said a little bit, Earth system science is a field of study that seeks to understand and very often seeks to quantify. So I'll be coming back to this theme of quantification quite a lot. Um, the dynamic processes really at the planetary scale um, although obviously to understand global processes, very often we need to understand micro level processes too. Um, and we are really interested in the interactions of the physical parts, atmosphere, oceans, ice sheets are particularly important for climate stability, land and life itself. 
really. We have to be interdisciplinary. We're interested in physics, chemistry, and biology, briefly. Um, and when we combine our understanding of the physical and the ecological and these biogeochemical changes, we can see planet Earth is exiting the Holocene. So this ugly graph with lots of extremely wonderful scientific effort embedded in it is a simple representation of Earth's temperature. I mean, people always say, hasn't climate always changed? Yes, and if we look at one indicator alone, well, this has many proxy indicators compiled into one graph. Going back over millions of years before the present, Earth's climate has changed a lot. For the last, I don't know, 500 million years, you see these sort of huge swings. It has been much colder and muchter in the past. But really look at the last million years or so, the kind of the two panels on the right hand side of the graph. Um, the situation has been one of um, oscillations between ice ages and warm periods. And we're in a long warm period now. And that's the thing we call the Holocene. What we're all aware of because of the quantifications of climate processes is that we can see how our human caused carbon emissions, we're particularly interested in carbon because it's not just chemistry, it is also the chemistry of life itself. Um, CO2 emissions are causing global heating, they're causing climatic changes, really unprecedented over many thousands of years. CO2 concentrations haven't been as high as this for millions of years. When we look at the concentration um, of fossil air in ice cores. We're fully aware that if we don't cut emissions extremely fast, um, the world is emitted you know, by 2050 to zero. It takes zero emissions to stabilize climate at any temperature. So if we don't cut emissions down to zero or very close to zero um, within the normal feedbacks of planet Earth, we're gonna be hitting you know, two degrees in a few decades from now. And if, we don't bring it down to zero in by 2050, then we're looking at extraordinary heating of the planet, extraordinary disruption of the climate system. Up to four degrees is not unrealistic this century. And it wouldn't be as bad if we were just changing one thing at a time, but we're changing everything else. So here are some more quantifications for you. And I've chosen these rather quirky pictures to show just how precise and quantified our scientific understanding is of the state of the planet. We can look at extinctions, and these are extinctions that have been monitored over the Holocene. Again, there's 10,000 years of relative climatic and ecological stability that many people argue has enabled everything that we understand as human civilization to be possible. The settlements, the in sort of long range travel, trade, agriculture, they all rely on a predictable um, or reasonably predictable climatic conditions, which the Holocene has provided. So these are just three very quick pictures, one showing that as soon as people started hunting whales, there was exponential growth in the catches of large whales until they kind of ran out of their third species and then they moved on to other ones. Blue whales rose and collapsed first, then fin whales, then say, and even to the present day, minke whales. Um, we can see the human act in terms of um, reducing the, we, we map extinction spatially, not just by counting organisms. And we can do the kind of micro mapping by looking at the genetic library of life that is being eroded by extinctions too. So in a sense, there's no shortage of information proving, if you want, that humanity is exiting the Holocene. When we look at the chemistry, I mean, a lot of people, this starts to be a little bit more obscure, but in some ways for me, this is more terrifying than even climate and biodiversity loss, because in a way they're, they're immediate changes. People can, people might deny climate change, but at the same time, it is really obvious that the climate is changing to pretty much everyone in the world. The same thing, you can see um, um, ecosystems being changed in front of your very eyes, but chemistry is kind of more invisible, but also, um, scientists are extremely concerned about the ways that we're changing the chemistry of life in the oceans, in the atmosphere, and, you know, of life itself. So this is a relatively, oh, it's a very new paper um, that looks at just how profoundly different 
um, oceans of the past have been, and that enables us to say something about oceans of the future. In terms of the nitrogen cycle, when you change the flows of nitrogen and phosphorus and oxygen all at the same time. Um, I really recommend you read the paper. It's a very readable paper for a chemistry of the ocean study. But the most important thing that I suppose the summary of the paper says is, by changing the ways that we do things on land, by applying fertilizers for, but for um, industrial agricultural production, for instance, we're changing the fundamental biological functioning of the ocean. The biological pump is what we depend on for the carbon sink of the ocean, for stabilizing our climate. So by putting nitrogen on land, letting it get into the oceans, we're changing life, we're changing chemistry, and we're disrupting the systems that we ourselves are part of. So we can definitely say we're exiting the Holocene and in many ways people are starting to talk about entering the Anthropocene. And here and we've got micro quantifications of land use, freshwater use, pollution. Um, in all of these cases we can see the human footprint. We tend as scientists to still see them. We have a global land project, we have a global water systems project. We don't yet have a global planetary pollution project but we should have one. Um, but the thing I really want to emphasize as we move into this discussion about what sustainability means for a region or whole planet is that these are all connected. These are systemic changes. When you change one part of the system, you can see the consequences playing out somewhere else, somewhere else in space, somewhere else in time, and obviously somewhere else in this planetary ecosystem that we're part of. So what does that mean? What's sustainability from a human perspective? I often go back to the Brundtland report. I mean, I obviously really cherish Agenda 2030 in many ways as well, but the catchy people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership five Ps doesn't really capture me what sustainable aims, sustainable development aims to do or should aim to do. And the Brundtland report I mean, again, it's still kind of poetic rather than necessarily analytic here, but it aims to promote harmony among human beings. And the reason I like it specifically as a statement of what sustainable development should do, it recognizes this interplay of humanity and nature. So although it's a very simple statement, it actually in the Brundtland report specifies that it's a complex process that needs attention to many more things than just some unspecified economy. Um, it's definitely worth reading, it's long, and this little quote from it comes from the end of chapter two. But I want to sort of really emphasize it, it talks about preserving the ecological base, it talks about administrative self-correction, the kind of recognizing that we might have done things wrong in terms of our politics, technology and production systems, and find a way to um, restructure the way societies work. We have um, really entire infrastructures, academic infrastructures and science policy platforms um, documenting how the biophysical changes that I described earlier have detectable and attributable effects on ecosystems and societies all around us. Um, we have them for biodiversity, for climate, for land and water to some extent, and pollution. And again, I want to just emphasize that we have them in separate pots. This integrative challenge is a huge um, um, obstacle for society and a huge challenge for science at the moment. Watch this space. We're trying to do it better every time. And as we just heard, um, we can set our contemporary changes in the context of very long-term, large-scale um, conditions that maintain Earth's stability. And that's exactly what the Planetary Boundaries Framework tries to do. It sort of says, are we in the Holocene? Yes or no? No, not in the Holocene anymore. Let me show you the ways. Um, and in many cases, we've got quantification of the past variability and the extent of the pressure that our human societies are placing on the planetary process, processes. And of course, when you see this kind of large scale, long term perspective of human effects on environmental dynamics, the conclusion by pretty much every scientist involved is humanity must act. The planetary boundaries are being reached so far. 
But this, of course, opens up the question, who exactly is humanity? So now we get to this. Now we're moving into the really interdisciplinary part of the discussion. Um, when we talk about humanity as global scientists, um, it's very easy to slip into this sort of unifying, universalizing kind of narrative. But it's also vitally important that we remember how lopsided the scientific evidence bases is for the statements that we make. It still is, despite immense efforts across the world to bring in, well, to increase participation, but also to increase simple empirical coverage. Um, I've picked an old map that, from the IPCC. This is from the fourth assessment report. Um, the horrendogram summary diagram in the fifth assessment report is even worse. I've chosen this one because it sort of presents the whole world as warming. It's got a little temperature thing that says the whole world is sort of about half a degree warmer than it was um, before, um, well, when measurements first started being counted in this particular instance. So the world is yellow now and it's on a trajectory to go pinkish red. But when you look more closely at look at where the observation sites are, the vast majority of climate observation sites are in North America and actually in a rather specific part of North America in the national parks in the Northwest. Um, so when we've got observation sites for climate and atmospheric chemistry, although we say we've got a global story, in practice, a lot of the evidence is gathered in, in a few particular places. Yes, we have global networks, but not with the same kind of high resolution, um, high sensitivity um, capacity to detect change. When we look at ecological systems, it's a similar pattern, but it's just lopsided in a different way. Europe has an extremely long tradition of um, conservation and protected areas. This isn't quite the same thing as observed changes in the same picture, but it's kind of a, a measure of concern for the living environment. We have very, very few systematic observation and protection processes across the rest of the world, just when we need them most. So, I mean, obviously, th for, that doesn't change the big message. We're not Logically going to discover that actually the planet is okay if we have more observation, but it puts knowledge in the, the power of holding knowledge in particular hands in the world. And so if we really care about sustainability as something for all of humanity, we really need to make sure that everything from the science and knowledge basis is also um, for all of humanity. A project I'm working on, I have been working on for a while and I want to finish fast, um, is also recognizing that when we talk about global change processes, we treat humanity as if there was just one kind of human. Typically, that kind of human is a man. Um, we have a very gendered world, but we have very ungendered global change science. The argument for climate change that I have to admit I kind of fell for for a few decades was when we're looking at the planetary scale, the kind of it, we're all humanity, we don't need to worry about these little differences. Climate change is expressed and framed scientifically as a global issue. And so year after year or assessment report after assessment report, gender doesn't even appear in um, um, working group reports. Physical science, maybe you can get away with it, but mitigation, adaptation and vulnerability, there are profound differences. Um, in people's exposure, whether they're men, women, young, old, rich, poor, um, and their capacity to respond to the issues. So my task that I'm trying to work on at the moment is to call attention to this. Many people are beginning to call attention to it, but it is a structural challenge that is not going to be able to be fixed by the time of the next assessment report. Biodiversity was framed in its convention as local and national. So in a sense, it, it, it locks gender in, in the text of the convention itself. It recognizes the difference of responsibilities, priorities, power. But even there, kind of irrelevant that it recognizes it in the text of the convention if nobody implements measures taken to support a socially differentiated involvement in protection and conservation of biodiversity. For natural resource use, things like the uh, 
The Global Environmental Outlook reports often mention gender and the most recent ones explicitly mentions gender. But what you see very often in these reports and what they have observed themselves is that women's economic role is very often downplayed. Women harvest fish, they don't, they're not fishers, they don't get involved in industrial fisheries in, in these narratives of, of large scale change, for example. Um, another aspect of this is very often um, we in the West, wealthy, white world, look at gender in other parts of the world and diagnose it as a problem or diagnose it as something needing action, rather than thinking about our own complicity in an unfair, imbalanced um, understanding of the world. For pollution and waste management, there's a lot, I mean, just masses of research on gender, but it's because men and women respond differently. So men aren't as actors in here I mean, with different, again, responsibilities, priority, power and knowledge, but really um, women's biology just messes perfectly good analytical processes for understanding impacts. So I think I'm just flagging this because I think this is an area too where the Nordic nations have had, um, uh, have been prominent about talking about gender equality and fairness. Um, and it would be very interesting to see how that plays out when we dig deeper into the quantifications and the response options. Another point that I want to bring through, and I think this is becoming more discussed now, is this very much view of a kind of a homogenized world. And I've got two um, narratives that I, I'm gonna show in this particular slide. <clears throat> One is this idea of the great acceleration. My colleague Will Stefan and some others over the last couple of decades have been tracking these sort of exponential curves um, of, of socioeconomic trends and, of course, of the ecological consequence of those trends. But even the choice of the word, the great acceleration, it's speaking to a particular narrative um, of sustainability or unsustainability. And people have asked, um, what would happen if we renamed it? What other processes are going on that we could use when we're talking about global change that somehow don't resonate so powerfully with a growth story, with a, a story of power? Um, and and you know, kind of acceleration sounds good if you're that kind of um, vroom, vroom, vroom person. Um, whereas thinking about the blanding, the, the kind of needed more destructive words to describe what we see here. And even the same thing with the word Anthropocene, where people talk about this, this is the era of, you know, man's control of the planetary destiny. Um, that term alone has been discussed a lot by, often by anthropologists, and I picked out as um, Haraway and colleagues have talked about, you know, we've geometrized the whole world with fields that are square and, you um, Everything. So kind of how else can we talk about the planetary processes that somehow show the, that hold on to the, the unfairness and the differences in humanity because they matter. Um, you saw Jason also mentioned um, justice and I think we face an important role. I mean, scientists, biophysical scientists, don't have the vocabulary in their everyday research to talk about justice, but global change forces us to think about this. Um, what we have right now in the world is a tendency also for the response to the problems of unsustainability to be framed in a globally homogenized way as well. And I think this is something that needs challenging, needs um, part of the problem, not part of the solution. And I think this is something we'll discuss quite a lot today. So what does this all mean for business? Um, well, we try hard to use the planetary boundaries framework in conversations with business decision makers. The, the metrics of the planetary boundaries framework, and again, the planetary systemic understanding that's embedded in it, needs an awful lot of effort to translate into metrics and units and understandings that, that business decision makers can apply it, you know, every day, if you're going to translate a 10,000 year baseline to uh, business cycles of days, quarters or years, then there's an awful lot of thinking to be done. Um, the positive aspect of this is that actually there's a really strong consensus in the science and a really 
active um, coverage of the global issues in multilateral environmental agreements of different kinds. So we can tell businesses that by acting sort of strategically on the planetary priority, the, the planetary boundaries frame highlights, they can be contributing to achieving global objectives as well. Um, through things like the well, sustainability reporting of different kinds, particularly on, on carbon and climate under things like the CDP reporting processes, businesses already take quite a lot of action on the sustainability challenges, but they are sort of, it's a pick and mix of what scale, what, what part of the value chain, um, and it doesn't, but there's no basis for making it all add up to the change in the desired direction. And so this is also a research challenge for us. Um, and of course, there's some big gaps. Um, carbon and climate have had a lot of um, uh, attention um, for the last 30 years because it's been global policy for the last 30 years. But also, I think, because it is quantitative, you can give a budget, you can track something. And OK, the fact that they're tracking their own decline doesn't necessarily um, detract from the, the power of quantification there. Other things like biodiversity, especially, are much, much harder to clump. No, it's not even harder. It's dangerous to clump biodiversity into a number, I would argue. And more fundamentally, when we recognize the interactions of these things, we need to sort of also have responsive metrics, not just flat budgets that are kind of imposed universally. So we're really working hard at the moment to find ways to describe the strategic connections between climate, biodiversity, natural resource use and pollution. And we can be really clear um, about the actions that are needed and to some extent about the quantifications that, um, that, that are available for helping business to track their contributions to these problems and their responsibility um, through their value chains. Now, it's challenging for us to talk with business because every year that passes that they don't act on climate or that they fail to act on biodiversity, that changes the numbers for them. And, you know, that process of sort of deferring action to 2030 or by 2050 will have done something. If that detracts from action this year, 8% reductions now in emissions, um, we, we end up sort of being caught up in a, a slightly too late rather than just in time um, strategic response to global change processes. So an activity that is happening right now across many, well, internationally through initiatives like the Future Earth Strategic Network um, for, for Science is extending from the science-based targets that have been rare, yeah, fairly effective for, this is a bit tentative here, that have been effective for climate and carbon emissions to these other issues, biodiversity and resource use as well. Um, the message that I and some of our colleagues are desperately trying to keep in that conceptual sort of way of understanding it is that climate and biodiversity kind of are each other. Um, if we are thinking about a living planet, you can't just tackle climate um, without thinking about how it plays out through living systems. And to be fair, you can't just protect a bit of biodiversity anymore without thinking about how it affects um, or is vulnerable to future climate changes too. So more and more, we're trying to get this message across about the interacting um, and interdependent um, global pressures that the world is under. And my recommendation for all of this is always, it takes time and it takes dialogue to be able to sort of, when you're dealing with a rapidly changing world, you can't just slam a, a single quantification rubber stamp onto something. It needs to be sensed, it needs to be monitored, it needs responsive, um, responsive strategy rather than flat bang strategy. Another thing that we really have to try and get across, of course, and this is directly relevant to what one region can do to change the world, um, 
is making sure that that these efforts of integrating science into business, integrating business into social responsibility, um, span the scales from everyday decisions that happen now by business about their purchasing, about their production and consumption processes, about the bigger living resource system that they're part of, about the business ecosystem that makes up their value chain from you know, everything that goes in to everything that goes out. And of course, in this context of global growth setting. Um, so we're there right now in the world. There is recognition that we need concerted action. There are businesses that are saying, we want to be seen to be sustainable. There are societies holding businesses <clears throat> to those claims and trying to sort of scrub away the greenwash to see what color is actually beneath. Um, so I am going to stop there and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. This talk will be longer next time I give it because I'm hoping the rest of the day will fill in a final section for this, but thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I mean, marvelous. Uh, thank you. And now we go uh, to to some short uh, short possibility for short uh, uh, question to you before we go to general uh, discussion. 